Chapter 34 The Journey's End There was one more odd wrinkle in the story. Wendy Rowder, a law clerk for Siegel, had been asked to check on Stokely. It was the weekend when Dupree deliberated about putting the Stokely witnesses before the jury. I talked to Wendy Rowder, now a lawyer in Northern California, about her bizarre weekend with Helena Stokely, hoping for a few salient details that might help put Stokely in perspective. Wendy Rowder I was just out of law school. I started working on the case in March of 79, and I was waiting for my bar results, which I passed in May of 79. And then, by June, I was off to Raleigh and wound up living in the dormitory with the defense team. And it was a Saturday morning. You were in a dormitory? At North Carolina State. It was a Saturday morning, the very next day after she testified. I remember little things that stand out that don't have any legal significance. Being told the judge had ordered McDonald to pay for Stokely's hotel room. Wasn't she brought in as a witness? She was brought in as a witness by the FBI on the judge's orders. I don't know whether she was under arrest or not. She wasn't free to leave. They didn't keep her in custody, at least that weekend. And it was a Saturday morning, and I was the only one in the office. I had gone in early. I answered the phone. And I spoke directly to the motel woman, who was yelling, Get them out of here! Get them out of here! I called Bernie, and he said, You better go down there and see what's going on. He told me something about the motel woman saying that Helena was being beaten up in the swimming pool. He said, Take Underhill with you. And I remember that when we got to the motel, the journey's end, the motel lady showed me the room. I walked in and Helena's holding her hand to her nose and there's blood all over the place. And the motel woman is still screaming, get them out of here, get them out of here. And I don't know what's going on. I had not had any prior contact with her. And Helena is screaming at the boyfriend, who's there only in his underwear. No shoes, no socks, no shirt, and there's blood on the bed. And I said, what happened to you? She says, I walked into the doorway. Unlikely, but that's what she said to me. Who is the boyfriend? Ernie Davis. So the motel woman is screaming, and Helena is screaming at Ernie, and Ernie is screaming at Helena. It was an incredible scene. And finally, I was able to get her attention to focus on me long enough to say, Do you want him out of here? Meaning the boyfriend. She said yes. So Red started, and I started saying, Come on, she wants you out of here. Pack up and his suitcase was opened up, but she's still with her hands, still with the blood coming out of her hands to her nose, and she's throwing everything in the motel room that she can think of into the suitcase, the ashtrays, the towels, and Underhill agrees to take him to the Greyhound bus station, and he agrees to go, and I agree to get the landlady to... He was not a witness, right? He was just along for the ride? Yeah, he was along for the ride, right, right. He was with her when the FBI picked her up, and we got the motel lady to back off about kicking her out right then and there. Now I'm alone with her. My heart is pumping because here I am alone with a woman who is in the house with the killers, and also so important to the case. Meanwhile, I was busy calling Bernie every fifteen minutes, and he's saying, just talk to her, just talk to her naturally. And I asked her if she wanted me to go, and she said no. So I stayed with her, and we started a conversation talking about, well, I have a background in theater, and I shared that with her, and then we got into her love of opera. We talked about opera and theater. She loved opera? Yes. Any operas in particular? I can't remember. I just remember my efforts to keep the conversation going. I have this picture of Helena Stokely listening to La Traviata. Who knows? But when I became a public defender, I worked with a lot of mentally disturbed persons, and she was not mentally disturbed. She may have had all kinds of neurotic kind of problems, but she was not what we call in California 5150. She was not in that league at all. 5150 is... It's the code for involuntarily committing somebody. I expected somebody zombieish because I heard about all the drug use, and she wasn't. She came from a fairly middle-class background, too. Her father was a big shot in the military, and so we made small talk. And suddenly she interrupted whatever it was to say, You know, I still remember being in that room. I said, What room? She said, That room in the McDonald house. 
She had the memory of holding the candle, only it wasn't dripping wax. It was dripping blood. At some point, she started talking about feeling guilty. And I said to her, why don't you just get on the stand and just say it like it happened? And that's when she made a comment about, I can't do that. The prosecutors will, I don't remember if she said, fry me, burn me, or hang me. It was one of those three. But I didn't know that she had been interviewed by Blackburn. Indeed, after her interview with the defense and its witnesses, Stokely had been interviewed by James Blackburn. And at one point I said to her, well, what do you expect me to do with this information? I said to her, don't tell me all of this because it's useless. You've got to come clean with somebody that's in a position to clear Jeff. And she kept saying, I can't do that. That was the extent of it. Bernie wanted me to hang out with her as long as possible, but the judge interrupted that. He got on the phone. The judge called you? Yeah, he called me. And he called me. She had by that time moved to another hotel. I guess she did get thrown out eventually? Right, we agreed to have her go. I rode in the car with her to the Hilton. She asked me to spend the night with her. She said, couldn't you just stay with me? I don't want you to leave me alone. I don't know what would have happened had the judge not called. But how did the judge know where to find you? That was the weirdest thing. It was in the lobby of the Hilton. Somebody says, are you Wendy Router? I say, yeah. They say, Judge Dupree wants to talk to you. And he gets on the phone and says, Router? That's what he called me, Router. Router is doing her best impression of Dupree's southern drawl. Yes, Your Honor. He said, Are you with Miss Stokely? And I said, Yes, Your Honor. He said, Well, I don't think that's a very good idea for a defense lawyer to be with a witness. He said, I think you just better go and leave Miss Stokely to herself. Yes, Your Honor. How he knew who was watching. The motel lady may have called the police, then the police may have called him. I don't know. I have no idea how he knew. It was so weird to get a call in a hotel from the judge. And that was my Helena experience. During the weekend that Dupree was deciding on whether or not to allow the testimony? Yes, but I assumed that McDonald was going to be acquitted and I'd be out of a job. I didn't know... Really? You thought that this was going to be an acquittal? Yes. Why? I didn't think that they had the evidence. I thought their evidence was all speculation. If this happened, then there would have been this piece of evidence. I just didn't think the evidence added up. Did you believe Helena Stokely? I truly expected somebody who seemed a little bonkers, and she seemed totally level to me. First of all, when Jeff described the person, besides the officer who saw somebody fitting the description, Micah's testimony... When Jeff describes to the police artist and then that particular drawing is shown to people and they recognize it, how lucky can Jeff get to pick somebody at random who is then going to confess? To make up a description of a person who happens to falsely confess? That gave me a mindset to believe her, because I just couldn't imagine Jeff being that lucky. That didn't fly with me. She carried on a conversation with me about stuff totally unrelated. I believed her. Yeah. I believed her. Do you believe that she was hidden by the prosecution? Yes. Don't forget it was a shock when the government found her. Siegel had been asking them for years, how can I find her? How can I locate her? I want to interview her. It had been going on for nine years. And the answer was, we don't know. Then within hours, they bring her in. Siegel announces, I want to call all these witnesses. And she's found in hours. What do you think? How was she found in hours? I believe they knew where she was all along. Chapter 35 Clearly Untrustworthy I could imagine Stokely's eight-year-old confessions could be seen as inadmissible evidence, but her statements to Router over that weekend changed all that. Except for one thing. Dupree ruled on the inadmissibility of the evidence before Router could testify. The Court Since court adjourned on Friday afternoon, I have spent a substantial portion of my waking hours researching and deciding the rather interesting evidentiary question which was posed, the question being whether statements tending to be against the penal interests of the witness Stokely should be admissible through other witnesses. 
statements made outside of court in far distant times. I will rule that these proposed statements do not comply with the trustworthy requisites of Rule 804 b 31 that far from being clearly corroborated and trustworthy, that they are about as unclearly trustworthy, or clearly untrustworthy, let me say, as any statements that I have ever seen or heard. Which is it? Unclearly trustworthy, or clearly untrustworthy? This witness in her examination here in court, and cross-examination, has been, to use the government counsel's terminology, all over the lot. The statements which she has made out of court were all over the lot, so it can't really be said that the hearing of those statements would lead to any different conclusion than what the jurors got while she was here in open court. As I stated, this testimony, I think, has no trustworthiness at all. Here you have a girl who, when she made the statements, was in most instances heavily drugged, if not hallucinating. And she has told us all that herself. She has stated that in person. On the question of trustworthiness, I just can't see it. Now, on the question of impeachment, as I stated, I don't think it is admissible on that theory, for the reason that I don't think it is impeaching. There are other reasons which I won't elaborate on right now. Finally, I think that this evidence ought to be excluded as a matter of discretion by the court under Rule 403 because its probative value is substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice. It would tend to confuse the issues, mislead the jury. It would cause undue delay and a waste of time. So I think in the interest of time, having devoted two days to this subject, that that is enough and for the additional reason that it ought to be excluded under 403, I will hold that it is not admissible. The rug has just been pulled out from under him, but Siegel soldiers on. He will be allowed to put the six witnesses in front of the jury, but he will not be allowed to ask them about Stokely's confessions. Yes, you can call John Wilkes Booth to the stand, but please don't ask him about the Lincoln assassination. Jane Zilio is on the stand. Siegel has returned to the meeting on August 16th. Stokely was in an office with the various witnesses. Bernard Siegel. Did Miss Stokely continue to look at those photographs more than once? Jane Zilio. At least four times she kept going back to the photograph of the smallest McDonald child, the one that the baby was laying in bed in a pool of blood and had its little bottle. Now, let me show you some photographs that have previously been marked in evidence and see perhaps if you can tell us which one of the photographs Miss Stokely returned to. It was this one. The witness has indicated the photo that has been marked for identification as Government Exhibit G60, Your Honor, which has previously been identified here in court as a photograph of Kristen McDonald in her pajamas on the bed. Did she say anything the first time she looked at the picture? James Blackburn. Your Honor, we would object. Sustained. Did Helena Stokely ever indicate to you that she had ever seen the scene or the person depicted in that picture previous to the time that she looked at that book? Objection. Sustained. It continues in this vein. Objection. Sustained. Objection. Sustained. The discussion turned to the photograph of the rocking horse. Now, in regard to this particular photo, what, if anything, did Ms. Stokely say to you about that photo? George Anderson. Objection. Brian Murtaugh. Objection. Sustained. Did in any way Ms. Stokely indicate that she recognized seeing that scene herself? Objection. Objection. Sustained. Did Miss Stokely say anything at that time about the totality of the scenes depicted in there? That is, did she say anything indicating recognition and prior knowledge of the places and events depicted in those photographs? Objection. Objection. Sustained. Did Miss Stokely say anything to you within the time that you were in the room, witness room with her, about having carried a lighted candle in February of 1970? Objection. Sustained. 
I have no further questions of Miss Zilio at this time, Your Honor. The goal of the lawyers for the prosecution was to discredit Stokely as well as the supporting witnesses, and it was entirely successful. No narrative emerged. For the jury, a hopeless jumble of story fragments conjoined with equivocations and evasions, not inherently untrustworthy. Untrustworthy because of the way it was presented to the jury, but that's the way the court wanted it. Later that day, Wendy Router took the stand. Her testimony showed that Stokely had not only confessed in the past, but was still confessing. Wendy Router. After a pause, she said to me, I still think I could have been there that night. I then asked, what makes you think so? She said, I don't know. There was a pause, and then she said, that rocking horse. There was another pause, and she added, you know, Kristen, Kristen Jean. Those pictures, when I looked at those pictures, I knew I had seen her somewhere before. Another pause, and she added, and that driveway, I remember being in that driveway. Was that the end of her remarks about the McDonald case at that juncture? Specifically placing herself on something concrete, yes. There were more allusions to her involvement, though, in that particular conversation. Later on in the conversation, did she have occasion to be specific about some connection or involvement with the McDonald case? The specificity was, I had said to her, Elena, well, let me read, I'm sure I could say it. At one point I asked her if the guilt over all these years has ever left her, and she said, No, what do you think I've taken all these damn drugs for? I later asked her if drugs help relieve the memory, and she said, No, because you always have to come down. I volunteered that the guilt must be awful trying to live with, and she said, Yes. All right, now, did this conversation continue until some point when she made further statements about the McDonald case or relative to the killing of the McDonald family? There was another conversation about guilt. I asked her, if McDonald were convicted, could you live with that guilt too? She said, I don't think so. She repeatedly asked me if I would stay with her at the hotel, and I said I didn't think that would be such a good idea, but Red would stay with her if that was okay. Would you feel comfortable with Red? She said, Oh yeah, I would trust him any day. All right, now, at some later time than at the Hilton, did she make some statement to you in regard to her knowledge of the McDonald case or the killings that took place in February of 1970? The first statements she made were not at the Hilton. They were at the downtown or motel. How did that take place? Mr. Underhill had gone upstairs to get his clothes. Again, our conversation was predominantly small talk. There was a pause. She said, I still think I was there in that house that night. And I said, Helena, is it a feeling you are having or a memory? She said, it's a memory. I remember standing at the couch holding a candle, only, you know, it wasn't dripping wax. It was dripping blood. Is that the last conversation you had with her yesterday that related to the case? My follow-up to that was, Elena, why don't you just go and say that in court? And she said, I can't with those damn prosecutors sitting there. Chapter 36 The Four-Legged Table August 28, 1979 The Start of Closing Arguments Blackburn had said in his opening arguments, Physical evidence doesn't lie. To which Siegel replied in his closing arguments, the government says physical evidence doesn't lie. They said that in the beginning. They say it now. I want to tell you something. Physical evidence doesn't say a darn thing. Physical evidence lies there. The fibers lie there. Everything lies there. The only thing that is speaking is not the physical evidence, but it is the interpreter speaking. Who is the interpreter of the evidence for you? The nonpartisan, the fellow on the white horse in the shining armor? Not at all. It is my adversary, my opponent on the other side. On May 18th, 2011, I spoke to Bernie Siegel for the first time. He had become a professor of law at Golden Gate University in San Francisco, but I had heard that he had been deeply wounded by this case. Let me tell you an anecdote, which is a favorite piece of pain of mine in this case. 
Starting in 1970, I was begging for the forensic evidence, and we were not getting it. For almost ten years, we begged and pleaded to get the CID and the FBI lab reports, and we never got them. So that forensic evidence was something of a mystery in the case up until the moment it was going to be tried. When it was clear that the case was going to be retried, I made the motion to have discovery of the forensic evidence given to the defense, and Judge Dupree denied that motion for discovery. I wrote 29 letters to the government saying, let us see the evidence. It was always, not now, not now. Finally, about six months before we were going to go to trial, I made a second motion. The first motion was in 1975, and this one is in 1979. Give us the forensic evidence. The government said, defense is not entitled to this forensic evidence because they didn't ask for it in a timely fashion. What are you talking about? For the last two and a half years, I'm begging and pleading with you guys. I was absolutely livid. Absolutely livid. So I said, I want a hearing on this motion, judge, and the government to answer me. I fly out to North Carolina, and the judge calls the case. I walk up to the bar of the court, and I say, Your Honor, the government's answer that we never asked before is an outrage. It's an absolute outrage. And all of a sudden, bang, the gavel is smacked. I won't have it. I won't have it. I won't have you talking about the government that way. You apologize. And we then had a staring contest. The judge was waiting for me to apologize, and I'm not apologizing. In the end, his answer was their answer, that we were not entitled to get the timely access to the forensic evidence because we hadn't asked for it in time. Under normal circumstances, might this even be grounds for dismissing the case or reversing the case? No? Well, the courts are not quick to dismiss cases for what may be considered a procedural gap, such as not giving us the evidence there that we needed. But this was a terrible, terrible miscarriage. In a case entirely built upon forensic evidence, to not allow the defense to examine it? Now, we did look at a few pieces of it. We got to go into a jail cell, and there's a table with a lot of junk piled upon it, and an FBI agent standing there with his arms folded over his chest, giving me the evil eye. And two of my associates, we walked around the table and we looked at it. We couldn't touch anything, of course, lest we contaminate the evidence. Thereafter, it was pointed out, the defense has been given the opportunity to examine the evidence. You have to be without scruples, without moral backbone to have said that to us. Now, you had already hired Thornton, right? Yes, and John was going to bring aboard other forensic scientists. We would have had a team, although we were so far behind. The government had four and a half years to put this together, and we had only four and a half months, and we still didn't get the chance to really examine everything. Let me ask you something. You say Judge Dupree's decisions were so outrageous. Why do you think Dupree did this? Did he hate you? Did he hate McDonald? Is there some reason that you can think of why he conducted himself in this way? Maybe he didn't like me because I was Jewish. And I went to McDonald at some point and said, Jeff, everything about this judge is wrong. It may be that he will take it out on you that he doesn't care for me as a Jewish lawyer. And I'm going to withdraw immediately, and you can get somebody else. And Jeff said no. He didn't want to do that. So that was your first meeting with Dupree. And then what happened? The next four and a half or five months we spent racing around, trying to get the little bit of evidence that we got from the government, and trying to get our case together. I put together a case, it was, we said, four legs of a table. Leg number one was the psychiatric testimony. It was an absolutely critical and an amazing facet of the testimony. If you want to see what kind of man Jeffrey MacDonald was in 1978-79, I can show you, because I have the videotapes of the hypnotic session, where I had him examined by a psychologist from Los Angeles. He did a hypnotic interview of McDonald, and I have those tapes around. In fact, I have seen the tapes of McDonald's hypnosis session, and they have a powerful effect on the viewer, suggesting a deep reservoir of painful, vivid memory inside McDonald, one that he does not show in television interviews. But I can't consider them evidence on their own. Leg number two was Helena Stokely's confessions. My God, I had seven different people from seven different sources all say that over a period of two years or so, Helena Stokely made a confession to being at the crime scene. Now, she never said that she murdered anybody. 
She said she was there, and she said she was along with them for the ride, but she herself didn't use a knife or a weapon on anybody. And the other side of it was that the judge said, No, I'm not going to let it in. It is unreliable testimony. It's prejudicial. How the hell is it prejudicial? It's a confession made to third parties. So two up and two down. Then, leg number three. We wanted to introduce the findings of the military court. There was actually a federal rule of evidence which said that we could introduce the ruling of the military court. And I said, well, that's pretty good. Now we've got three things going for McDonald. Leg number four, the forensic evidence. We were prepared to show how it was really fraudulently put together, that it was the weakest part, not the strongest of the case. Okay, so we had four legs of our table here, and the judge chopped off each one of them. It was the great four-legged defense that never got off the ground. It was a nightmare, an absolute nightmare. And the allegation that the judge's son-in-law was one of the original prosecutors? I wouldn't say that was the reason. Dupree was a typical right-wing judicial appointment. When the vacancy in the federal bench came up, they made him a judge. He was a lawyer of no distinction, of no federal experience. And so, in his view, whatever the government tells him, the government is always right. So there was a bias that we felt all the time. Also, he was a moron. A moron? An absolute moron, and a racist. A very nice young woman, about 22, 23 years of age, was one of the speculative jurors. She was African American. She walked up to the witness stand to be questioned, and before anybody asked a question, Dupree said, You're from over in Johnson County, aren't you, young lady? And her answer was yes. Well, then, of course, you would like to be excused so you can go on home and help your daddy pick tobacco. She said, No, I made preparations as soon as I got noticed to serve on a jury. I made preparations. I'm available. He said, No, no, young lady, your daddy needs you on the farm. I will excuse you. Not the government excuses you, not Siegel excuses you. Dupree just kicked her out, and there went one-third of the black jury pool that we needed. The government didn't even have to use up a challenge. For God's sake, what's going on in American justice? Just before the beginning of the trial, MacDonald had hired, with the blessing of Siegel, Joe McGinnis, a successful young journalist who had published a number of bestsellers, including The Selling of the President, 1968. It had been on the New York Times bestseller list when he was 26 years old. McGinnis had defended McDonald in a short column for the Los Angeles Herald Examiner on June 14, 1979, entitled Jeffrey McDonald, Living a Nightmare. Its last paragraph read, He finished his coffee, picked up the check. He had left half of his ham and eggs on his plate. In two weeks, he would fly to North Carolina accused of the slaughter of his family. For now... He would work the four to midnight shift as director of the emergency room at St. Mary's Hospital in Long Beach, where, if it were a typical shift, he would quite likely save a life or two. McGinnis was invited to join the defense team and lived with them at the Kappa Alpha Fraternity House on the North Carolina State campus where they had assembled during the summer months of 1979. I asked Siegel about McGinnis. And how does Joe McGinnis figure into all of this? This case was tried on a zero budget. There was no way of raising funds. That's why we did the book routine. The book routine was intended to give McDonald access to some funds that could be used for his defense. After the conviction, McGinnis started worrying about the storyline. At first he said, My God, how unbelievable. What a catastrophe. And then later McGinnis said, it could have been a month or two later, but it's clear in my mind that he said it. I don't think that the publisher will be interested in this story. Only guilty men get convicted. Siegel died on August 12, 2011. He was 81 years old. There were many questions I had hoped to ask him, and didn't get a chance. Siegel was a Philadelphia Jew with a skullet, bald on top, long on the sides, in a North Carolina courtroom. He was contending with a deck heavily stacked against him. Dupree rejected motion after motion after motion. Some were provocations issued by Siegel. Others were entirely reasonable, but rejected nevertheless. How about bail? 
Denied. What about giving Thornton access to the handwritten lab notes? Denied. Siegel was forbidden to introduce psychiatric testimony beneficial to his client. Forbidden to present Stokely's extraordinary history of confessions. Forbidden to introduce Colonel Rock's report or any of the findings from the Article 32. The government was allowed to grandstand and peddle junk science in court. Was it really necessary to read into the trial record much of an issue of Esquire devoted to Satanism? Dupree allowed it, and much more. Siegel met Dupree in 1975 at the beginning of the grand jury hearing. They hated each other instantly. But every indication shows that Siegel did little to mitigate it, and much to exacerbate it. By 1979, there was open hostility in the courtroom. Chapter 37 The Slaughterhouse For truth is but justice in our knowledge, and justice is but truth in our practice. John Milton, Iconoclastes The closing arguments continued. Although the physical evidence was discussed in detail, the defense never effectively dealt with any of it. Instead, the arguments devolved along predictable lines. For the government, the proof through physical evidence that MacDonald was the killer, for the defense, the almost total absence of motive. Murtaugh began. Our duty was to take you through a tour of a slaughterhouse. Not a slaughterhouse for the defendant, certainly, but a slaughterhouse for Colette, Kimberly, and Kristen. It was our duty to show you many pieces of physical evidence, much of it grotesque, and to put these bits and pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together. Just as the defendant is not entitled to a perfect trial, only a fair trial, he isn't entitled to a perfect crime scene, either. The government's case does not rise or fall on whether the crime scene was perfect. The government's case rises and falls on whether the physical evidence connects the defendant, beyond a reasonable doubt, to the commission of this crime. Now, since the defendant has been trained by his own admission in special forces to withstand interrogations such as a prisoner of war doctor might be subjected to, he knew that if he was going to tell a story, he would have to tell as much of the truth as possible. He would have to tell the sequence as nearly as possible, but the reason why he touched something would, we contend, be fabricated. This, we would argue, is really a cover story within a cover story. Now, since he would have to repeat this time and time again, as I have said he would have to, there is a grain of truth in the sequence of his movements throughout the house. We believe that we have proven by physical evidence which is indisputable, and which is cold and which is logical, that the defendant and no one else committed this crime. Now, if we have convinced you of that beyond a reasonable doubt, but you are still uncomfortable because we haven't answered the question as to whether the defendant is the type of person who could have done this, I submit to you that that is an emotional doubt and not a reasonable doubt. I would again ask you to recall the court's instructions that you decide the case on the basis of the evidence and not on the basis of emotion or prejudice. Blackburn continues where Brian Murtaugh left off. His summation is concise and moving. I am not trying to suggest by and in of itself that because the defendant was not killed, he is therefore guilty of the slaughter of his family. I don't think that is sufficient evidence. I am not saying that. I am saying that when you compare and contrast his injuries to their injuries with the other physical evidence that we have, it certainly should raise in your mind the question as to why he was not hurt worse. Ladies and gentlemen, the defendant's theory of defense in this case has sort of been like this. I tell a story, and you are to trust me. I am telling the truth. I loved my family. I loved Colette. I loved Kimberly and Kristen. Trust me, I couldn't have done this. I could not have done this. There has been a lot of character testimony. They say I can't do this, and therefore, because I am not the type of person, I couldn't do that. Ladies and gentlemen, as Brian Murtaugh told you this morning, if we convince you by the evidence that he did it, 
We don't have to show you that he is the sort of person that could have done it. Ladies and gentlemen, if in the future after this case is over, if in your jury deliberations, you should think again of this case, I ask you to think and remember Colette, Kimberly, and Kristen. They would have liked to have been here. They have been dead for almost ten years. That is, right now, around 3,400 or 3,500 days and nights that you have had and I have had and the defendant has had that they haven't. They would have liked to have had that. If in the future you should cry a tear, cry one for them. If in the future you should say a prayer, say one for them. If in the future you should light a candle, light one for them. We ask for everything in the name of truth. We ask you, ladies and gentlemen, that this horribly tragic and horribly sad as it is, because you know that you have seen Mrs. Kassab and you have seen Mrs. McDonald, and it is sad for both of them. Both of them were grandmothers, not just one. It is sad for the defendant. But it is sad most of all for those who paid the highest price of all with their lives. And we ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to return a verdict of guilty as to clubbing and stabbing Colette, guilty of clubbing and stabbing Kimberly, and guilty, perhaps, most of all, for stabbing little Kristen. I am sure you have heard it many times. Part of the thirteenth chapter of Ecclesiastes. There is a time for everything under the heavens, a time to be born, and a time to die. Surely God did not intend on the 17th of February, 1970, for Colette, Kimberly, and Kristen MacDonald to die. It is time, ladies and gentlemen. It is so late in the day. It is time that someone speak for justice and truth and return a verdict of guilty against this man. I ask this jury to make what I know to be a very courageous decision, that he did it, and we are sorry. But he did it. Thank you. Siegel starts the summation for the defense. It goes on for two and a half hours. A desultory mess. Now what kind of proof, and how are you to weigh the kind of proof the government has offered, which must be beyond a reasonable doubt in this case? It is circumstantial evidence. It is the indirect kind. Circumstantial evidence should not be less clear than direct evidence. It should not be more obscure and more difficult to follow. It ought to point correctly and clearly to the conclusions as argued by the side that offers it. It ought to point in a way in which, when you would hear it, you would say to yourself, I do not hesitate. This is a matter of importance right now. I do not hesitate on these facts or on the conclusions that they want me to draw from it. These facts don't allow any hesitation and doubt. I do not have a reasonable doubt. I must convict. That is what circumstantial evidence is. It says that it has got to be clear enough for you to figure out that it really does stand for proof beyond a reasonable doubt on that subject. It is the indirect evidence, and you have heard all about that, but do not for a moment consider the idea that because someone has called it circumstantial evidence, that therefore you are allowed to be confused by it, and therefore say, well, I will accept some lesser amount, some lesser quality of this proof, because they have called it circumstantial evidence. That is not the law. We all too frequently take the system that we cherish and fight for, and that we hope to preserve. We sometimes take it rather for granted, and do not consider why the elements exist. The presumption of innocence is something that exists only in a criminal case. It does not exist in a civil case. The reason for that is that there is an inherent fundamental imbalance in a criminal case which no defendant can ever correct. That imbalance is this. On one side of the criminal case are the prosecutors. They are not the government. They are the prosecutors who use the power of the government on their behalf of their clients. Their interest in this case... I dare say that it is obvious to comment that there is no individual defendant, let alone Jeffrey MacDonald. There is no individual defendant that you or I could conceive of whose power ever would equal that of the government. 
Take the worst CID agent you saw, the most inexperienced MP investigator, the newest FBI agent, and you send him knocking on a door. He says, I would like to talk to you about the McDonald case. I don't want to talk to you. I am an agent of the FBI, CID, MP. What is going to happen when you tell somebody, I am the representative of the government's criminal prosecution process? What happens is that you will think, gee, if I don't cooperate, what are they going to do? Take me downtown? Is someone going to call my employer and tell him that this is the government and your man will not cooperate? Are they going to look at my tax returns, perhaps? I don't know if that is real, but they are the suspicions that we all have. James Blackburn Your Honor, we would object to this. Brian Murtaugh Your Honor, we would object to this. The Court well, I will just instruct counsel for both sides to confine your arguments to the evidence that has been offered and received in open court. Go ahead. Has Siegel forgotten where he is? This is not San Francisco or Philadelphia. This is Raleigh, North Carolina. Is he going to lecture a jury of white tobacco farmers and ex-military men on the dangers of a police state? Tax audits. The specter of the jackboot? Has he hopelessly misjudged his audience? What does he think he's doing? In my view, if the case had not been lost already, it was lost here. Siegel had used up more than his allotted time, leaving no time for Wade Smith to address the jury. Blackburn and Murtaugh graciously forfeited part of their time to allow Smith to make a closing argument. James Blackburn your Honor, the government has, as I understand it, forty minutes left, and the defendant is out of time. That is right. We have agreed, since Mr. Smith has not had an opportunity to speak, to give him ten minutes of our time. All right, Mr. Smith. I am grateful for the ten minutes, and I would ask Your Honor to tap the bench, please, when ten minutes are concluded. Wade Smith addressed the jury. Don't you wonder why, when you think about this, why did it happen? Don't you wonder, when you are thinking about whether Jeff did it, why would he have done it? Can you think of a reason why he would have done it? There isn't any. The prosecution is not under any obligation to furnish a motive. The law does not place that burden on them. Nevertheless, that is natural law. That is law that we feel inside of us every one of us. We feel that we can say to the prosecution in any case, tell us why, tell us why this man would have destroyed his family. Think about the photographs that you saw of Jeff with the family, Jeff with the children, Colette with the children, the children playing. Think about Major Moore arriving at an unscheduled lunch stop. Think about the children running out and grabbing Jeff and climbing all over him a few weeks before this happened. Think about how Colette came to him and announced with joy that she was expecting a child. Think about how they embraced, according to Major Moore, and how they walked into the house with Jeff with his arm around her, and Major Moore walking with the children, talking and enjoying themselves at lunchtime. Everything was going well. There was not anything going on in their home that you have seen in this evidence that would indicate that this man would do a thing like this. If you look at the autopsy photographs of those little children and think about what it would take to cause someone to raise a knife and destroy them, to destroy Kristen, not just destroy her, but absolutely mutilate her, just beat her to death, thrust after thrust after thrust. It can't be true. He needs peace. He hasn't had it in a long time. You as a jury are immensely powerful because you can give him peace for the first time in years and years. Thank you for hearing me. The next day, August 29th, the case went to the jury. They deliberated for only six hours and found MacDonald guilty on two counts of second-degree murder for the murders of Colette and Kimberly and one count of first-degree murder for the murder of Kristen. The verdict was announced on the same day. Dupree sentenced him to three consecutive life sentences. MacDonald, facing Dupree in the courtroom, said, Sir, 
I'm not guilty. I don't think the court heard all the evidence. That's all I have to say. Freddy Kassab described that moment. According to Kassab, McDonald had requested 24-hour U.S. Marshal protection. And when the jury returned with their verdict, there were six U.S. Marshals between Kassab and McDonald. Freddy Kassab. It seems that McDonald was afraid I might kill him, because in January 1976, when the circuit court dismissed the case on speedy trial grounds, I had publicly made the statement, and it was printed in the press, if the courts of this country won't administer justice, I most assuredly will. This is the end of the CD. The audiobook continues on the next CD. Book 4 Chapter 38 The Use and Abuse of Physical Evidence We need history, but not as a spoiled loafer in the garden of knowledge needs it. Nietzsche The Use and Abuse of History Too Little, Too Late Almost immediately after his testimony, Thornton learned that essential laboratory notes had been withheld. I asked Thornton about the prosecution's role in restricting the defense's access to evidence. I was powerless to do anything. Now, after the trial, I got a visit from someone in the attorney general's office, and an FBI agent out here came to my house and said, Do you really think he's guilty? How the heck would I know? It isn't my business, really, to determine guilt. Any notions that I have about guilt or innocence are really irrelevant. And a little bit dangerous, too, for somebody that does the kind of work that I do, or did. Dangerous? I need to consider evidence as evidence, not from a position of advocacy. But I thought that it was kind of telling that the prosecution would send somebody out from D.C., a couple of people out from D.C., to sound me out and right after the trial. Why would they do that? Well, I don't know, but right after the trial, within a few days, I spoke to Brian Murtaugh on the phone, and he asked me the same question. Do you really think he was guilty? Does that mean that they themselves had doubts? That was how I construed it, yes. Here's a question. Do you have an opinion about McDonald's guilt or innocence but prefer not to say... Or do you think that the evidence has been so screwed up that one is really deprived of an ability to form any rational conclusion? The latter. No, I'm being candid with you. I'm not totally convinced of Jeffrey McDonald's innocence. If he is in fact guilty, then it's an incredible thing. Somehow he's managed to convince himself that he didn't do it, and in the process convince other people as well, but I don't know. I think there's a residue of possibility that he did. But in terms of proving that he did, I don't think the prosecution did that at all, and they played dirty. See, my feeling is that physical evidence has to be held in trust for both sides. That's pretty much California law. It's not federal law. In this case, the federal prosecutors viewed the evidence as chattel. It was their property, and they were going to use it in a manner that they alone would determine. Did they frame McDonald? No, it's more complex than that. It's like some Kurosawa drama or something. Like Rashomon? Exactly. Here's my take. Right from the outset, the case was really mismanaged. McDonald went to the Article 32 proceedings, and he was cut loose. And if he had kept his mouth shut, that probably would have been the end of it. But no, he went on Dick Cavett and he would complain about his treatment to anyone who would listen. And that pissed off his father-in-law and the attorney general's office because they were outraged at Jeffrey McDonald's hubris in going public. And then that pulled the trigger and set in motion all these irreversible activities, the grand jury, the trial. Yes? I don't think it was an intentional thing to frame an innocent man. Here was the prosecution's thinking. We have a really marginal case, screwed up to begin with. But just because it was screwed up, that shouldn't mean that he should escape justice. Let's go back and see what we can come up with. But it was your feeling that Dupree was biased? Yes. Dupree was affable with the prosecution and would scowl at Siegel. But that isn't going to be reflected in the records. No appellate court is going to say, well, the judge did something improper. 
but when I asked for samples at the start of the trial, that went back to court. Judge Dupree, of course, ruled against those motions. Prior to that, Dupree had said to both sides, you people work it out. That's like expecting red ants and black ants to work it out. But it was unbiased. It was corrupt, particularly the reconstruction of the ice pick holes through the pajama top. It was specious, but it really wasn't just Stombaugh. It was Shirley Green that did it, and Stombaugh signed the report. Why do you call it specious? MacDonald is saying that the pajamas were pulled over his head like in a hockey fight. That the stabs were not when his hands were in the sleeves, but rather when the garment was stretched out between the assailant and himself, and so the stabs were through unoccupied fabric. I don't think that's implausible, but the way they presented their reconstruction, my God, the color photographs with the pins sticking out, and the pajamas on the mannequin at the trial. Yes, they were effective. I'd use the word seductive, but they were effective. But Stombaugh said, well, you know, it could be other ways. There could be some other interpretation. Hole 17 might be correlated really with number 3 instead of number 7. But he passed over that very quickly. And his fingers were never held to the fire. On May 7, 1982, a month after MacDonald's final return to prison, Thornton wrote to William H. Webster, the director of the FBI. Dear Judge Webster, I have exceedingly grave reservations concerning the physical evidence aspects of the McDonald case. As I perceive them, the defects are not all of the same sort and have arisen from different circumstances. Taken in concert, however, the defects have had the same effect, that of distorting the physical evidence and in some instances representing clearly erroneous interpretations of the evidence. I have no particular interest in embarrassing the Bureau, and indeed, with one exception, my criticism of the handling of the physical evidence is directed at other agencies. The one exception, however, is in my mind an example of the abuse rather than the use of physical evidence. What follows is a recapitulation of Shirley Green's testimony about the folded pajama top. But there is something new here. Thornton had only been given the typewritten reports from the FBI. The bench notes and other records had been withheld. The defense did not have an opportunity to examine Mr. Stombaugh's bench notes until after he had finished his testimony. At that time, it was apparent that a number of discrepancies existed between Ms. Green's reconstruction and Mr. Stombaugh's original determination of the directionality of the punctures. Of the thirteen holes designated, there were six discrepancies with the Shirley Green reconstruction. Changing the directionality of even a single hole contravenes the Shirley Green reconstruction. The reconstruction, therefore, is not valid. Thornton had argued something like this during the trial, but here was proof that the FBI lab knew that the reconstruction didn't work, but presented it as evidence nonetheless. It's not clear whether Webster ever wrote back to Thornton. In all likelihood, he did not. But Thornton's views were discussed in an October 27, 1982 letter to Webster from D. Lowell Jensen, an assistant attorney general. It was made perfectly clear that this was the end of it. It is our view that any reprocessing of the crime scene for alleged undetected evidence should occur only as a result of an order from the district court, and that in that event no processing should be done by defense experts. There would be, of course, no order from the district court. Dupree had no intention of processing or reprocessing anything, nor did the government. From the end of the trial, there were petitions from the defense to be given access to the crime scene. Murtaugh refused. He argued, in a 1983 response to the request, that the quarters in their present condition have no evidentiary integrity as a crime scene, in the absence of any factually accurate, legally sufficient, scientifically valid, or other compelling grounds for a second re-examination of the scene, the motion should be denied and the quarters returned directly to military control. On June 4, 1984, the CID removed the medical supplies, earplugs, sepacol, syringes and tongue depressors, seven candles, and two decorative wine bottles covered with wax. 
On June 7, 1984, in the middle of an appeal, whatever was left in 544 Castle Drive was burned. Chapter 39 A Rounded Picture Following his conviction, MacDonald was sent through a revolving door of legal review. The federal prison on Terminal Island immediately following his conviction, released by the Fourth Circuit Court on a speedy trial claim on July 29, 1980, returned to work at St. Mary Medical Center in November 1980, then back to prison by a 6-3 decision of the Supreme Court on March 31, 1982, with Chief Justice Warren Burger writing for the majority. However, once the charges instituted by the Army were dismissed, MacDonald was legally and constitutionally in the same posture as though no charges had been made. He was free to go about his affairs, to practice his profession, and to continue with his life. The Court of Appeals acknowledged, and MacDonald concedes, that the delay between the civil indictment and the trial was caused primarily by MacDonald's own legal maneuvers. Ah, shades of Kafka. If MacDonald had cooperated, rolled over and merely admitted guilt, then these unfortunate delays could have been avoided. But the issue of Stokely's unheard testimony stubbornly remained a part of the case. Justice Thurgood Marshall, in his dissent, wrote, It is possible that Stokely's trial testimony would have been less confused and more helpful to MacDonald at an earlier date. This testimony was critical to MacDonald, whose principal defense was that she was one of a group of intruders who committed the murders. Although Stokely was hardly a reliable witness, she did testify at trial that she had no memory of the events that night, in contradiction to some of her earlier out-of-court statements. The majority's opinion in this case is a disappointing exercise in strained logic and judicial illusion. Six months after the Supreme Court decision, MacDonald's lawyers were back in front of the Fourth Circuit. This time, the appeal challenged Dupree's exclusion of the testimony of the six corroborative witnesses from the MacDonald jury. What were his reasons? According to an exception in the hearsay rule, Federal Rule of Evidence 804-B3, you can present second-hand testimony, one, if it is against interest, and two, if it has been corroborated. Stokely's statements to those witnesses were clearly against her interests. She was claiming to be present at a triple homicide. And there were six witnesses to her statements, seven if you include Wendy Router. What more corroboration do you need? Don't these statements corroborate each other? Essentially, Dupree argued that 804b3 didn't apply, because if Stokely's mind was a potato, there was nothing to corroborate and nothing could be against her interest. The Fourth Circuit agreed. While MacDonald is able to point to a number of corroborating circumstances, he does not demonstrate, finally, that they make Stokely's alleged declaration trustworthy. Her apparent long-standing drug habits made her an inherently unreliable witness. Moreover, her vacillation about whether or not she remembered anything at all about the night of the crime lends force to the view that everything she has said and done in this regard was a product of her drug addiction. She was a drug addict. What more needed to be said? The decision of the three-judge panel on August 16, 1982, was unanimous and against MacDonald, except for one odd wrinkle. One of the judges, Francis D. Murnahan, Jr., felt compelled to write a concurrence, simultaneously agreeing and disagreeing with the majority opinion. Murnahan wrote, The case provokes a strong uneasiness in me. It was an uneasiness precipitated specifically by the Stokely evidence, or more specifically, its partial exclusion from the MacDonald trial. The defense of a marauding, drug-crazed, purposeless group of homicidal maniacs is one which, absent the events surrounding the behavior of Charles Manson and the excruciating horror of the indescribably base murder of Sharon Tate, would have been dismissed as so incredible as to merit no serious attention. All that changed with the advent of Manson. Thereafter, the possibility of such an occurrence, while still macabre, was considerably enhanced. 
The evidence, in my humble judgment, tended to show an environment in the vicinity of the military base where MacDonald was stationed in which persons might indeed emulate Manson or independently behave in such a fashion. Helena Stokely was shown to be a person of no fixed regularity of life, roaming the streets nocturnally at or about the time of the crimes, dressing in a bizarre fashion, and capable of so short-circuiting her mental processes through an indiscriminate taking of drugs that, a, she could well accept her presence, and, to some extent, her involvement in the MacDonald murders, and, b, she could become so separated from reality that, on the fatal evening, she was ripe for persuasion to participate. I conclude with the observation that the case provokes a strong uneasiness in me. The crimes were base and horrid, and whoever committed them richly deserves severe punishment. As Judge Bryan, the senior judge on the Fourth Circuit Court, has pointed out, the evidence was sufficient to sustain the findings of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Still, the way in which a finding of guilt is reached is, in our enduring system of law, at least as important as the finding of guilt itself. I believe MacDonald would have had a fairer trial if the Stokely-related testimony had been admitted. In the end, however, I am not prepared to find an abuse of discretion by the district court, and so concur. But how could Murnahan concur with the majority opinion if he truly believed that MacDonald would have had a fairer trial if the Stokely testimony had been admitted? A fairer trial? Where does fairness shade off into unfairness? Should the phrase be changed, some justice for all? Murnahan called attention to one of the central problems with the case, namely the problem of context how the world had changed between 1970 and 1979. Justice Marshall had said essentially the same thing. In 1970, it was easy to conjure in the mind a marauding, drug-crazed, purposeless group of homicidal maniacs. It didn't take much conjuring at all, since it was only months after Charles Manson and his family were arrested and splashed across the national news. But in 1979... Nine years later, Manson had already receded into the crepuscular memory palace of history. In this different setting, MacDonald's claim that his family had been killed by drug-crazed hippies seemed far-fetched. Unbelievable. Even laughable. Bernahan remembered that in 1970 it was neither far-fetched nor unbelievable. Certainly not laughable. The concurrence contains one more counterfactual. One more what-if. In view of the issues involved and the virtually unique aspects of the surrounding circumstances, had I been the trial judge, I would have exercised the wide discretion conferred on him to allow the testimony to come in. My preference derives from my belief that, if the jury may be trusted with ultimate resolution of the factual issues, it should not be denied the opportunity of obtaining a rounded picture necessary for resolution of the large questions by the withholding of collateral testimony consistent with and basic to the defendant's principal exculpatory contention. If such evidence was not persuasive, which is what the government essentially contends in saying that it was untrustworthy, the jury, with very great probability, would not have been misled by it. If Murnahan had presided over the 1979 trial, he would have allowed the Stokely testimony but Dupree took a different tack. When it came to the Esquire magazine, the pajama top, the blood evidence, Dupree let the jury decide whether the evidence was meaningful. But in the case of Stokely and the corroborative witnesses, he said, in effect, leave it to me. But what does Murnahan mean by the large questions? Isn't the largest question the question of guilt or innocence? Did he do it? Did he commit these terrible crimes? The Murnahan concurrence reminds us, or should remind us, that legal procedure should be in the service of justice, not the other way around. But it is the last sentence of the concurrence that is backward reasoning. The jury, with very great probability, would not have been misled by the Stokely testimony. That is, they would have convicted MacDonald anyway. Since he's guilty, he would still be guilty with or without the Stokely evidence then why bother with evidence at all? 
In Through the Looking Glass, Lewis Carroll takes this argument a step further. Not just sentence first, verdict afterward. Better yet, punishment without crime. It's a poor sort of memory that only works backwards, the Queen remarked. What sort of things do you remember best? Alice ventured to ask. Oh, the things that happened the week after next, the Queen replied in a careless tone. For instance, now. She went on, sticking a large piece of plaster on her finger as she spoke. There's the king's messenger. He's in prison now, being punished, and the trial doesn't even begin till next Wednesday. And, of course, the crime comes last of all. Suppose he never commits the crime, said Alice. That would be all the better, wouldn't it? The queen said, as she bound the plaster round her finger with a bit of ribbon.